Welcome to episode eight, where we interview Edward Addison. Edward is a hypnotherapist who also has a, or is working towards a master's in psychology. In this conversation, we discuss how hypnotherapy works and how you can use it as a tool to overcome things such as addiction and also self-help and progress in your own life, overcoming trauma. And we also discuss the law of attraction and which parts we believe in the kind of mainstream are real and work, where the shortcomings are, are, and also how to really kind of use the subconscious and subconscious programming to bring about change in your life. So I hope you enjoy. Um, There's a lot of value in this interview, in my opinion. Uh, I've listened back and I thought it was... uh, yeah, very valuable, and uh, Edward's taught me quite a lot along the way. So enjoy, and as usual, please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you soon. Hi, Edward. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I wanted to get you on the show because I've actually worked with you twice in the past. And I think you've got quite an interesting uh, experience, an interesting story. Um, for those that don't realise, Edward specialises in hypnotherapy, um, coming at it from a few different angles. So I was quite interested just to introduce yourself and your uh, background to the audience, and then we can sort of go through there and start talking about the discussion of hypnotherapy. Yeah. Um, so I've been a therapist for eight years. Um, so kind of counselling, hypnotherapy, life coaching. Um, I'm working my way through my master's in clinical psychology at the moment. Um, so that should be finished in a few months' time. Um, but I found that with hypnosis, massive changes can be made that um, it shortcuts essentially a lot of the therapeutic work that other modalities can take a long time to work through and to kind of unpack what you can do in an hour of hypnosis work is just astounding. So that's what's kind of, plus hypnosis is kind of an interesting subject that's kind of out there enough to be intriguing. There's bits that we don't know about the human mind. And and so, yeah, it kind of gives us a opportunity to tap into areas of the mind and brain function that we don't kind of get to discuss in other areas of therapy and in life in general. Perfect. So am I right in saying that you come to hypnotherapy um, sort of specialising originally in trauma, which also leads and can work alongside addiction. Yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, there's a um, kind of a consistent approach that I use with most of the people that I work with. Um, and the understanding of kind of where I'm coming from in my training is that so all behaviours come from thinking. And a lot of our thinking is unconscious. So um, our conscious experience of the world is just the tip of the iceberg of what's really going on in our mind. And that human behavior actually gets driven from unconscious processes. So when we go through life and we have experiences, good, bad, and indifferent, particularly the bad ones, they shape our thinking, our perspective, our interpretation of the world, and that shapes our behavior. So Yes, you can unpack that through kind of psychoanalytic stuff by chatting about life and things from the unconscious bubble up to the surface while you're talking over weeks and weeks and weeks. What hypnosis does is it relaxes the conscious busy bit of the mind that acts as a distraction from being able to access those deeper parts. And so in a session, when you get into hypnosis and it quietens the busy part of the mind, you can then more easily communicate with that deeper part, the unconscious part, where all the beliefs, fears and hopes and dreams live. And if you can correct the patterns of thinking in that part of the brain, the behaviours then change in the kind of conscious experience. Yeah. Do you do you work specifically alongside the like brain waves? Like, do you try to get someone to a specific brain wave, or do you just not kind of... not specifically? I mean, I have read a lot of studies about that and about yeah, um, your kind of theta and your beta waves and stuff. Um, essentially, oh God, over the last few years. Um, I've worked with so many people that there are, I use visual, physical cues to recognize where someone is in the state of what we call hypnosis, which is a massive, um, that word carries a lot of baggage with it. Um, people think of 
eating onions, thinking that they're apples and cooking like chickens and, you know, dancing around on stage. And that's really just nothing to do with <laughs> what I do. Um, we're, we're talking it, suggestibility and potentially yeah. like self-help, self-improvement. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not trying to convince, we have this idea, I think, that people tell me to hypnotise them not to eat chocolate anymore or hypnotise them to do something. And that implies changing what they think about the world or about something. That's not what I do um, as a hypnotherapist. What I do is I help people to recognize the, the emotional and psychological difficulties they have in their thinking and human experience. And if they can let go of the past, essentially, they yeah. are then free from the challenges that they have behaviorally in their life. Yeah, so it's more about sort of going deeply within to understand psychological reasons as to why you do yeah. the thing you do, self-sabotaging mechanisms. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, so, so you started, like we said, with like trauma, which must have been pretty traumatic for you as well to sort of <laughs> see and delve deep into that. Yeah. And then you've you've moved across different topics like addiction and then things like weight loss and, and stuff yeah. like this. So... I'm guessing you've seen this work. It's not specific on one sort of industry, so to speak. It, it can no. work across a multitude of different. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll give you an example. So I worked with a guy who was a firefighter um, and he had been suffering for seven years with post-traumatic stress um, because he had witnessed the passing of someone um, while he was on a job and he'd been restricted by the confines of his um, job role, shall we say, um, without saying too much about his um, individual yeah. case. Um, that he couldn't take a certain action and that it resulted in someone dying. And then for the seven years after that, he had anxiety and depression and anger and substance issues and sleep issues and all sorts of chaos in his life as a result of sort of guilt and resentment and anger and sadness and all these things. And so when he and I worked together, he'd been suffering, his life was, it felt to him like a bit of a wreck. Um, and so we spoke for an hour and we kind of, what I call mapping, we kind of explored how he feels about things and, you know, where he is at basically and where he's come from and that sort of thing. Not in great depth, but to get an understanding of what was going on. Yeah. And then we did a, we did a session of hypnosis where essentially I would help him get into that state where he can more clearly look at his deeper feelings and then helped him to have an, a dialogue with himself, recognizing that the feelings that he holds on to were resulting in so many behaviors in his life that were ruining his life. Wow. If he wanted to be free of the <laughs> anger, the sadness, the resentment that he had to let go of the past, the price of being happy and free of the post-traumatic stress was that he had to let go of what had happened. Yeah. So it, the session was 40 minutes, an hour or so. And within that time, he got to the point where he truly let it go, let, let the past become the past. We ended that session, no more depression, no more anxiety, no more substance misuse, no more sleep issues, no more anger issues. Wow. So that very trauma that was deep in his subconscious has essentially changed the whole landscape of his life. It's yes. brought on yeah. addiction, it's probably brought on like compulsive behaviour. Yep. sleep issues which has a knock-on effect yep. so when when you're looking at people that say focused solely on diet or i don't know surface things there's normally like a deeper rooted yeah so little little timmy is running down at the promenade having a nice day falls over and skins his knee and he's bleeding he's crying he's sore mummy picks up little timmy and says please don't cry it's okay it's okay Here's an ice cream. Little Timmy then learns, I feel happy. I'm no longer sad when I eat ice cream. <laughs> 40 years later, Tommy gets made Timmy gets made redundant. And he walks out of work. His brain is saying, you're sad. You need to feel better. Goes and buys a tub of ice cream. Makes you think, how in control are we of our, of our lives? There, there's an example I always use, uh, and I always sort of think about this to remind myself um, to sort of do the subconscious work, right? And that's if you're, say you're driving a car, you're on the way to work, same route as always, you've got, you know, same radio show on, music, whatever. 
And then all of a sudden there's a police car or an ambulance or a fire truck behind you, right? Immediately you've you've almost forgot to drive. You forgot to like how to drive. You're like, oh shit, I need to move the car here. You're hitting the window wiper. You you know you're stalling the car. You're all over the place. And that's because that specific sequence of events that you you do every day, that that route you drive, the car you drive, the things you're listening to. You're so comfortable doing that. You're doing that in subconscious, like through your subconscious. So when something out of the ordinary happens, it throws you back into the conscious mind. And then all of a sudden you forgot how to sort of do. Yeah. 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 And it it makes me think, even when I do these interviews, the first sort of five to 10 minutes, I'm quite nervous. So I'm like in my own head, what I'm saying is echoing in my head. I'm overthinking things. I'm like, but once I'm in it, I'm just back in the subconscious. It's easy. It's flowing. Yeah. So it makes you think just kind of how much we yeah. are in that space and the decisions you make in your life. Are they really what you actually want or are they old, you know, autopilot habits and processes yeah. Yeah. or programs even? Yeah. Um, yeah. I often use driving as an example when I'm trying to explain and dispel some myths about hypnosis. How many times have you driven maybe five minutes, 10 minutes and you're like, holy shit, I don't remember the last five or 10 minutes driving. Like, every, every you're day. off miles away thinking about whether it's a holiday or a bill or what you're having for tea or whatever it might be. Well, you probably went around the roundabout or overtook or someone overtook you. Things happened on that journey. Or you changed gears, you're mirroring, mm-hmm. all these things. And you, you were miles away. You were miles away. That's hypnosis. Yeah, but if you were in your driving test, you'd remember every single part. And you'd be yeah. panicky and shaky and yeah. Yeah. wow. So with hypnotherapy, what what you're doing is essentially going into the subconscious, sometimes planting seeds. So offering like because um, I guess you're maybe you could break this down better than, than me because you're you're the professional. But essentially you're dropping down the guard of the conscious mind. And you're sometimes you're you're taking that individual to a specific event or a specific feeling, reoccurring feeling or whatever, yeah, it might be, yeah. and sort of nursing that as a um, as like an antidote, essentially. Yeah. Or the other side could be like I say, the suggestibility. So you're now in a position where the subconscious mind, which governs our lives to a large degree, you can offer that sort of suggestion which can sort of change the way, is it the reticular activation system? It, it can sort of yeah. change the way that you see. Yeah, I, I tend to not work too much with suggestion. Um, I mean, suggestion for change, suggestion that life can feel better. But I think that trying to convince someone's mind that they don't like chocolate, for example, is sort of like putting a plaster on a wound. Yes, you could, for a little while, they could be then convinced that they think that thing. But the root cause of that thing is still there, so it will work its way back through, much like if it's a wound, the infection is still inside. So, uh, yeah, you can cover it with suggestion. You can say, oh, you can smell dog shit if you see a bar of chocolate. And the, for a while, the brain will hold on to that and play with it, much like a stage performance. But yeah. in reality, there was a reason that that person developed an addiction to chocolate, for example. Uh, and so that reason is still there, driving the behaviour, and it will drive its way through your that suggested behavior, the new behavior. Okay, so so where do you stand on things like affirmations or visualization? I think they're I think they're great. <laughs> I think they're yeah, great. But but what if it's not addressing? So say for instance, I've always had this isn't true, but let's just say if I've always had money problems or yeah. self limiting belief or whatever it may be, yeah. yeah. If I'm doing affirmations and I'm visualizing overcoming these issues, but we've not actually dealt with the root cause, which could be, you know, things like you often hear parents saying money doesn't graft trees or you grew up in a poor environment and you always had to be tight with money and save money and careful when you spend money. Can you do you think that people could kind of overcome that through things like affirmation and no, no. So it is this self journey. It's not just listen to YouTube affirmation videos and Yep, I think um, you can't say, I am rich, 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 and one day you're going to get rich. doesn't work like that. Yeah. So what you might find is that, and I, we're getting into kind of law of attraction, manifestation type stuff. 
I think that there is, that's a huge subject, but there is a reality to law of attraction and that you can manifest, but not how most people think. I think that if you put posters of Ferraris all over your bedroom walls, one day you're not waking up and a Ferrari is going to be sitting on your driveway. Yeah. I think it can act as a, um, it changes your thinking so that you can then begin the journey that's required in real world terms to create that reality. So um, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is a bit embarrassing, but I used to have a, a manifestation prompt on my lock screen on my phone. And it said, I'm so grateful that I make 10,000 pounds a month. Um, and for, you know, I want to look after my family and it's, it is what it is. I'm not particularly proud of it. I wouldn't probably word it that way these days, but that's the truth. Um, and what I found was by seeing it all the time, my mind was on it. So I was thinking, well, what I am doing right now, if I, I would have to do this number of, see this number of clients, do this, blah, 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 blah. And that wouldn't work out as 10,000 pounds a month. So then I started had to start to start thinking about well what could I do differently how could I run could I do a, a podcast or you know and it, so it got me thinking about how to how I would do that and so ultimately it ended up changing my behaviour which has come to the point where now I am earning what I would like to be earning but it wasn't because I wrote it on a screen and then it just magically appeared the yeah. writing on the screen brought it to my mind frequently enough that I then was more aware of the work that I had to do. So every time I was driving and my phone was stuck on there and I caught it in my eye and it was then playing through my mind, well, how would that work? What about this? Without action, there is no manifestation that's going to happen. Yeah. I think, and I also think that your thought waves don't create, don't manifest. If we're talking, if we sort of want to get into like resonant frequencies and things like that, your feelings generate the frequencies that then attracts and repels things. Yeah. So do, you, do you think looking at the universe that you're rich and suddenly you'll be rich? Yeah. Sometimes it can have the opposite effect. So if you yeah. looked at I earn ten thousand pound a month, sometimes that could actually stress you out. Yeah. And bring you down because you know it isn't true. And then, like you said, you start. Some people would look at why it isn't true, and then the growth is normally in that uncomfortable realization. Whereas yeah. some people who want to be hairy fairy, new agey, law of attraction, they want to just lie to themselves. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's deep down, it's a negative feeling, but they're not actually actioning anything, and yeah. it's actually probably causing the complete opposite. And um, I was going to well, say, so well, uh, sorry, for one second, just to catch that thought well before we move on. If you wrote down every morning when you woke up, I I want to run a marathon on Christmas Day. If you wrote that down for 364 days of the year and you wrote it down a hundred times a day and never put on your trainers and went out and went for a run, it doesn't matter how many times you write it down or you think it or wish it or hope it. Yeah. You have to take action in the real world to make the things ha happen that you want to happen. Yeah, yeah. But if you wrote that down every morning and put your trainers on, well, the so idea of doing it is increased massively. Well, that's right. You, it's on your mind every day what you want to achieve. Therefore, it's a call to action, not yeah. just a hope or a dream. Yeah, or a yeah. Wish. Otherwise, it's just a wish. Yeah. I, I always think um, a, 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 a quote that I heard years ago that I think about a lot is, you don't get what you want, you get what you are. Yep. So in order to get those things you have to become the person that resonates with those things yep. and when you start to actually bring things into your life through whatever means people believe causes it it normally starts with a negative and you normally start to bring the shit into your life that if you overcome you become the person that has what you want so you don't just get what you what it is that you desire you get the lessons and the situations and circumstances yeah. that have to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, so going sort of a bit deeper, right, into the whole law of attraction situation. So obviously we've just spoke about how we think it, it, it actually really works. Do you think that our minds do create our reality to, to, a, to an extent or at least a sort of subconscious? 100% do. It does. So... Imagine one week after 9-11, okay? Yeah. Imagine 
you're a little Iraqi boy or Afghani boy at the local market where your mum, dad, auntie, uncle all work. So you're looking at the market and you're like, oh, there's my auntie, there's my uncle. Oh, you know, there's my friend. You see people, you see family going about business. So imagine then for a moment that you're the shop, one of the stall holders at the market. You see maybe your brother's got a stall over there. You see customers, you see competitors trying to sell similar things to you. Now imagine you're an American tourist. You see a guy in the back with a backpack, there's a terrorist. You see a guy with a beard, there's a terrorist. You're terrified cowering in the corner because there's terrorists everywhere. It's the same market. It's just a stretch of road with some stalls and some items. But who, what your experience has been of the world, maybe it's your mum and your dad and your auntie and your uncle just going about daily life, enjoying their life, or whether you're the American who's been convinced that Muslims are terrorists, then your perception of the world is interpreting the information. It's just information that's arriving at you and what your belief systems are shaping what you're seeing. And then you'll see more of the same because it's that confirmation bias. Yeah. yeah. And so the little boy might be seeing his uncle, two uncles chatting away, whispering, and they're planning a surprise par birthday for someone. But the, the American tourist is potentially seeing two terrorists plotting their next attack. Mm. Complete fiction in their mind. Yeah. But they've been shaped, particularly by a traumatic thing, to a belief and an interpretation of the world. I think all when when information arrives at the human body, it gets run through our belief systems before we actually see it or like understand what we're seeing and hearing. It gets run through the filter of our beliefs. So by shaping the filter of your belief, you can shape the way you see things, the way information comes to you, the way you. Yep, for good and bad, for good and bad, absolutely. And then it has a knock on effect, which can dictate the whole shape of your life as it yes. plays out. Yeah, well, if you're, if you're of the belief that every single human experience is an opportunity to learn new skills, to test your skills, to develop your skills, to is, is an opportunity in one way or another, all things, then you see opportunity everywhere. Yeah. If you see risk, danger, failure, fear everywhere, then everything's scary, disappointing, risky. That's entirely I've, the perception I've of the world. I've definitely ones. lived both. <laughs> I've manifested things that, I don't want to say manifest because I don't really like that, but I've bought things into my life through discipline of thinking and inner work, et cetera, right? That have been outstanding. Like I could tell you story after story that legitimately you'd be like, wow. But I've also done the same on a from a negative perspective, uh, especially during the whole 2020 situation. I was convinced that the government, you know, are overreaching and they're going to force the, you know, the whole jab situation and all of this. And I lived in fear for probably about two years. And, and I'm still somewhat concerned about the knock on effect that's going to have years later luckily i've kind of um, done a lot of self I, I used the opportunity to do a lot of self work and self realization and i view things very differently now even though a lot of the things i said were actually true but i've started to really realize that the power is actually within and how you you know the government can do whatever they want really as long as you have a strong mind and a strong belief and yeah. self discipline and self worth you can navigate around that and you will always find a way to you know to do what you what you have to do and the world definitely is a very abundant place as as we're often told it's not so if you come here from that perspective opportunities everywhere you know a, a friend of mine said years ago when we were talking about you know financial squeeze and whatever and he says go around your estate and i live in a very i'd say probably middle classy type of area and he said, go around your estate and just count how many houses like that are worth, say, half a million or more and how many people live there. And, you know, look at their cars and just think how much money they have to make to support that house. And there's hundreds and hundreds. And this is just my area. You know, if you expand that outside of my area and, and even globally, there's so much money flowing all the time, opportunities all the time. As new industries come in that change, you know, destroy the old industries, there's new opportunities. Yep. But you could all you could look at it from the other side of 
oh, things are changing and, you know, it's getting worse. It's always getting worse. And you could you could always argue that point because you can always find points to help your argument, essentially. Um, but what is that going to have in terms of a knock on effect in your life? You, you're probably going to see more of, of the same, right? Yep, absolutely. Wow. I mean, if I if if I said to you how many red cut, you know, I don't know if you've been out today or not yet, but if you spend the day out in the world and I said, how many red cars did you see today? Like, don't know. Maybe you might guess five or ten. Like if I said, right, I'll give you ten pounds for every red car that you can see and identify today as you go out on your day, I guarantee you, you're going to see more red cars because your mind is attuned to what to look out for. Yeah. So yeah, what what is brought to your attention, how it's brought to your attention, what feelings it's linked to, changes your whole perception of reality massively. And that is the reticular activation system there. So, okay, so there's a guy that I've followed for years, right? Neville Goddard. I don't know if you've, have you come across his work? I know the name. So he's like, basically like a Bible scholar, but he comes comes at it from a very esoteric perspective right some people say it's quite new agey others would sort of argue against that but what he's saying essentially is um like realize the feeling so if you're doing your visualization let's say you're not focusing so much on seeing what it is that you want to happen you have to feel it as if it's already happened is that something that you've kind yeah. of looked into yourself or yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's not easy, but it's if you can live, well, essentially, if you can live with happiness, love, and gratitude in your heart and then work fucking hard, you can basically create anything. <laughs> That's where it works. Yeah. So, where do you stand with things like fate or destiny? Um, I think that's a big, big conversation. Um, I to ask someone that practices what you practice, because you must see extraordinary, extraordinary things. Yep. So do you think that things are mapped out or do you genuinely believe that you can change things if you? Um, yeah, I, I believe in free will. I think we've all got a choice. We've all got personal responsibility massively. Um, I think, God, this is getting a bit theological for a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> But um, anyone that knows me knows that's where I that's where I go. <laughs> I I think let's see that hypothetically there's a God, and that God can see the beginning and the end of all things, so can see all of time. I would say that within our experience, we still have free will, just because He can see the finishing line of time. But if that means that time, if the Finishing line can then change every time you make a decision. Maybe that's why string theory or multiverse theory comes into it, that maybe we're constantly shifting between universes or dimensions that every time we make a split decision, it splits off again. I don't know how it works, but um, I think abdicating free responsibility, sorry, um, to say, well, it's fated, so what can I do about it, is disempowering. So even if I'm wrong, and it is, the I living your life as if your outcomes are not in your own hands doesn't tend to make for a happy life. Or ownership of all suffering, of all experience, um, not blame, not beating yourself with what goes wrong, but ownership of your own experience and creating ownership and responsibility for creating the life that you want is conducive to a happier life so have you seen specifically these changes in people where they are on a track to a certain place and you've seen like monumental shifts through your work or through oh absolutely i mean an infinite number an infinite number the thing is that if we if we are well, how, do you, how do you describe it i suppose we'll we will have genetic um, there will be genetic <laughs> components to who we are as a person. There will be maybe, um, well, there could be collective unconscious reasons that we think and we act a certain way as well. And then we have our experience that was experiences that we live through that shape us. So there are limits on what we can do genetically to change 
our experience of the world and how it all manifests in front of us. But as soon as someone starts doing the work of understanding what they've lived through and the impact on them of that, that they're either repeating something that they've been through or seen, they're rebelling against something that they've been through or seen, then the more inner work that they do to recognize why they behave the way that they behave, the more that they can break the old patterns of thinking in any area of their life. You know, father had a role, whether present or not, whether abusive or kind, same with mother, same with other family members, same with orphans who didn't have parents. It, it doesn't matter your circumstances. If you've lived a life, then you've had experiences. They are shaping your thinking. And therefore, when you start doing your inner work, often your shadow work, which is a subject in, in itself, um, and start correcting or processing and letting go of the old unhealthy thinking patterns and therefore behaviors, then life just changes massively. I've seen it a thousand times. Like, Do you think this extends with illnesses as well? Yeah, I think um, there's a massive, massive link between thinking and physical health. Yeah, I my first interview on this channel back um, from, because I did a few before, uh, I think it was 2020-ish. Um, but my first interview back was with a uh, German new medicine practitioner and we talk about you know he's convinced that every disease is psychological I'm still navigating around that but there's definitely something in it if you look at the likes of say John Sarno and the whole TMS situation where what he's saying is things like um, things like fibromyalgia for instance is a, is a good example a lot of the time it's man a manifestation of uh, like suppressed anger or suppress guilt and sort of feelings that people are pushing down. It's like the body takes score. So I think from like a physical perspective, you can see that. But equally, what he was saying is that psychologically, you create like neuro pathways that will create these symptoms. And the, the longer they, they, they go unchecked, the stronger they become. And then all of a sudden, you're you're falling apart almost. And once you start to realize this and you start to take back that power and control and you do work with someone like you where you go deep into maybe where the trauma uh, arisen from you can a lot of those symptoms can melt away yep, yep. so I, I actually had something similar during the whole uh, pandemic situation i was getting vertigo i was getting um tingles all down one side of my leg like my right leg and sometimes it was in my face here it was in my arm um I, was, I couldn't sleep. I was getting loads of issues. And I did some work with a guy and we went back through uh, like childhood situations. Um, what we realized is my biggest fear really is the fear of the unknown and like losing control. And we sort of really looked at why it, it, it was a lot of hard work for me, you know, but I really yeah. kind of went into it. A lot of self analysis and thinking I paid you know people money to like really help me get to it I saw a psychologist and we kind of went into it all and honestly it just melted away and it's not come back but if I went to the doctors I could have got any type of diagnosis yeah vertigo can be yeah yeah uh, and I think that could be a spiraling addiction almost because you could end up on all sorts of drugs and mm -hmm. different problems so it, it becomes controversial because if you tell someone who has ME or fibromyalgia that there's a link between thinking and physical health, they say they would argue often. I've, I've had this conversation. No, no, my symptoms are real. Mm. No one says they're not. Like the accusation is that it's made up in your head. Yeah. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying that there's a link between thinking and both the, how it manifests physically. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a study couldn't cite you at the moment, I can look it up for you. Um, it talks about how the, the brain waves that you create by your thinking or the, the, the electromagnetic pulses that you generate in your body that are shaped by your thinking, um, they move through your DNA and they switch on and switch off certain parts of your DNA. And when your thinking is more fearful and lower vibrational, it switches on less and switches off some of the, the wrong things and the, the more high vibrational your, your thinking is the more loving 
more gratitude type thinking, um, it actually activates more of your DNA and uh, is conducive to good health. Wow. There, there was a guy that I did some work with. He's an RTT therapist, so rapid transformation therapy. Yeah. <clears throat> and he told me a story. I thought this was unbelievable. I'm actually, I'm going to get him on the show because he's, he's awesome. <clears throat> he was telling me about this guy who was a veteran and he had a situation where he went out on a on a job and i think two of his colleagues and friends died right and he saw it happen and it was like horrendously traumatic and he was getting all sorts of psychological problems like uh, ptsd and couldn't sleep and just trauma and you know it was a nightmare addiction and everything yeah and he did a session and he was convinced that that was the problem. So they spoke about that. And this therapist was like, right, OK, that's fine. Let's go deeper. And he took him to his childhood and he realized this guy went to quite a it was like a very sort of middle agey area that he grew up in. And it was a quite a well to do school. And they were um, really big on rugby. So he's part of the rugby team. And when he was a kid, like young, he was rejected from the rugby team. Right. And he was focused on that and he really went into the feeling of rejection and the, and the situation that, that happened. And as soon as they sort of ironed that out, everything just disappeared. Yeah. And, he, and he was like, he was convinced it was to do with this real traumatic situation that he saw. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure that will have some sort yeah. of later, but <laughs> oftentimes these things are actually in, the, in your childhood. Yes. When, you're a, when you're a child, like being rejected or not being shown love or support or whatever from those people around you who are your you know protectors yeah. that can be some of the worst trauma you could ever face yes and also when you're really young we we are building our framework of understanding for the world so when we go through something we can't contextualize it in world experience and say what i went through is the exception to the rule so if you've got a, an abusive parent, you're learning that parents are abusive. You're not learning that most parents are loving, but mine is different because they've got their own issues. They've got addiction problems because they live through trauma. You don't understand that as a child. You're just meeting it straight on. And so, yeah, so you start to build beliefs like that thing that you went through that is an exception to the rule is in fact the rule and normal world. And so that's why... When you're building um, expectations, because we build a framework for the world so that we can accurately predict what's going to come. Yeah. So once, if you have a skewed interpretation of the world because you've been through awful or unusual situations where, you know, mum and dad are meant to be providing, caring, loving, consistent, da 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 da, and in actual fact you've experienced maybe the opposite in some of those areas, then you don't, you've not seen and therefore learned a healthy and way to interpret the world you've yeah. got a wholly unhealthy one and so that's how it skews off romantic relationships colleague relations you know the rest of your your, your world yeah I, I was talking to someone about my childhood so when i was three years old my mum and dad broke up and i stopped seeing my mum so i was raised only by my dad and obviously I don't remember that happening and I never really got answers. And it's only recently that I've really grown a, a relationship with my mum and we've actually figured out what, what actually happened. Right. And there's a, as usual, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of context to things, but I spent my whole life believing she left, you know, and it wasn't that simple. It was, you know, it's complicated. But anyway, I was talking to this woman and she was sort of, you know, the way I was talking, she could tell I was quite alternative. Bit of a conspiracy dude. I'm always digging. I'm always researching. And she's like, of course you are. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, you never got answers from authority when you was a kid. So the biggest thing that ever happened in your life, which is you not having a mum and growing up only with your dad. You never was satisfied with what you were being told. So you didn't you don't trust authority. And I was like, oh, my God. Like it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like that makes so much sense because even from like six or seven years old, I've not, tr I don't trust, I don't really trust people. It takes me a long time, but 
but I also don't trust the narrative. I'm very much a contrarian. So whatever a lot of people are into, immediately yeah. I'm, I'm the opposite. And I and I don't trust these things. And I, I always ask questions. And sometimes that is my strength and people like me for it. But other times it annoys people. And they're like, oh, let me guess. There's another conspiracy. But it's just in my, it's just the way I am because of the experience I had as a, as a child. Yeah. That's, so, exactly. that's mad. You know, I was going to ask you another thing. So, you know, this is something I think about a lot, right? So if you look at a child from being a baby till about seven or eight years old, they're like totally free in their mind. They're like a sponge. They're almost like I've got a dog. I've got a Labrador. They're like a dog in the sense of I need a poo. I need food. I need water. And I want to play. When they hit seven or eight, that's when they normally start to become aware of themselves and start to become sort of consciously observant. Yeah, I mean of the world, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they start to become like we are. And I think as you get older, it's almost like a disc. You, you start here and you go all the way back and you become childlike again. So you often find this sort of age, I don't know what age it might be, but let's say 70 to 90, they don't really care anymore. They're just free. If you ever see a baby with an eight year old, it's quite a magical experience because they're actually quite similar. And then you've got this big gap in between, which is us who are, you know, that age group who are very conscious and aware and worried and thinking and scared of what people think and all of this stuff. But in that period between being born and like six or seven, there's a lot of uh, accounts of children recalling past lives or recalling or, or even saying things that are incredibly wise um, because they're not uh, like programmed yet to be the way that we are within our society because essentially that's what you need to do you need to be programmed to operate within the society we live in otherwise you'll end up well you won't get very far so you, yeah. you almost have to do that to yourself as well and schooling and society kind of does that as, as well um, but do you think there's anything in that sort of, I don't know, because I think they live in their subconscious. I guess that's what I'm trying to trying to get at. They don't have this conscious thing that we have at that age of their life. And they seem to be able to connect to something that's bigger than what we can. D does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, they're just experiencing life as it is. They ha there hasn't been a, a mental prison built and overlaid on their thinking. And you're absolutely right that that school and societal expectation and I mean our parents are guilty of it we, we we get it conditioned out of us not to believe in magic or you know all those sorts of things yeah um I would say I'm open to it rather than I believe it I don't have a lot of conclusions about things like reincarnation um but I could accept that that this isn't our only shot at this game called life um and yeah, I um, I mean, I've got my own experience of um, when I was doing my hypnotherapy training, they showed us about past life regression and I did my own, uh, well, someone did my past life regression on me as part of the training. And uh, I've got all the affirmation or confirmation that I need that there seems to be something to it. Um, I was shown a street in Birmingham in a year that I certainly know nothing about Birmingham or what industry is there or what sort of years things were built. I wasn't hugely interested in history at the time. Um, and so the, what I was, what I saw, um, street names, years, that there was a factory in a certain place. And I looked it up afterwards and that was, um, it was all real. Did I read it in a book somewhere? Never read a book about factories or Birmingham <laughs> or, you know, or 1860s England. I don't think up to that point in my life I'd ever read anything like that. Could I have seen it somewhere? Of course I could. Seen it somewhere and then forgotten it and then thrown it up as a, you know, metaphoric story in my mind when I was in hypnosis. Maybe. Is it good enough to me? Good enough for me to think, well, that seems interesting that I came up with these things that seemed random until I Googled them and then they were confirmed. So, and yeah, and so kids, uh, particularly in countries where it's a norm. So, so Hindu countries where reincarnation is just an accepted thing. 
there are a lot of children that come forward and you hear stories of them saying that, you know, they belong to a certain town that's hours away and that there's no reason that they should know that town exists. And then they go into the house and they, they know the family members and their nicknames and where their bedroom was and that they had certain things in certain places. Like there's stories like that all the time. Um, and it's just because it's a, it's a given. So it's part of their accepted reality, unlike over here where we say, Johnny's telling stories, you know, don't be silly. So um, yeah, I think. So it's maybe that belief thing again, because, <clears throat> because we're uh, a country that doesn't really believe in these types of things, you just dismiss it rather than explore it and yeah absolutely yeah it's interesting i mean i've spent a lot of time looking into things like that and i i can't say i'm 100 percent sure but i'm relatively convinced based on you know what you're saying and these different accounts and and things like that you, have you ever worked with anyone who has had trauma from a past life and that's something that you've gone yes. into and explored because that that's something you read about a lot as well yeah it's not work that I do um, with people on purpose. I really have offered past life regression as more of um, kind of research into the metaphysical side of life, as yeah. opposed to using it as a therapeutic tool. But I have heard a lot of stories and read a lot of stories about people that have went into the past, maybe had chest issues in this life and then found that they drowned in one life and they were in a gas chamber in the other life or had an injury in a shoulder that they seem to have phantom pain in the shoulder in this life. Absolutely, I've, I've come across it quite a lot. Um, what, I, what I find is that there's so many like misconceptions about past life regression that ugh, the internet's got a lot to answer for in this. If you go online and you look at past life regression communities, there's about seven Henry VIII's, Elizabeth the First's, Cleopatra's, and all of them. I've, I've never, well, no, there was one lady, and she told me who she was before she went into the session, and I believe that she just, you see what you want to see to some extent. Most people that I work with go into a past life regression session with an open mind, sort of like a childlike curiosity, and what they see is not unicorns and princesses and anything like that. They see... Harold, the banker who wore brown shoes, lived on his own in London, you know, died at 51. Like, unglamorous, not, you know, just, nothing, normal. just normal. normal life. Yeah. Um, an Irish drunk, a guy that worked as a kind of, you know, for a forestry commission or, you know, like really simple, not like not sheriffs and not, it's not the content of movies. But when you go online, the people who believe that they are the reincarnation of these things, they seem to claim that they can have conscious recall, that they just woke up one day and they realized they were Henry VIII. But the people that actually go and do the process, I can tell you, I don't know if past life regression is really looking at past lives. What I can tell you is that the process is real in that when you go into hypnosis or led through a guided meditation, led to a library, find your book, there are pages in the book, there are pictures on those pages and you can seem to drift into those scenes and you observe something. Now, some would say, if you have a fear of water, obviously you drowned in a past life. Others would say, well, you've got a fear of water. So if your mind is looking at what past lives could be, of course, it's going to make up a story about you drowning. Yeah. So it's like, well, which way around is it? Are we, are we experiencing what we're experiencing because we lived it in the past? Or are we inventing stories about the past to justify our current existence? It could be either. Of course, it could be either. Um, so other, other than your own experience, because you've obviously sort of verified it by looking at this place in Birmingham and, and all of this, have you had any past life regressions that have been verified or you've verified or they've verified and come back to you and said, do you know what, that, you know, that scene that I played out during a hypno, you know, hypnosis session, yeah. I've actually looked into it and it's it's a real place or this is a real person. Yeah, um, there was ones, um, some of them are hard because once you go into kind of prehistory, so a tribe in an area, um, sometimes you get people that have 
described a certain item of clothing that you think that's a bit unusual. I wouldn't have expected that in Amazonian, you know, Central America. Or, um, and then they go off and they do some research and they find that the, the, the apparel of the people that they were describing matches with people that lived in a similar year that they came up with. And it's, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of it. It's again, it's really hard because it's possible that people have absorbed this information through their life and it's just coming back to them and they're not realizing that they knew it. But certainly there's tons and tons of examples of like war uniforms. And again, it's not great generals that people tend to be. It's a guy that died in the water, in the mud, in a field and, you know, Nora, his wife, <laughs> kind of got his medals or whatever, things like that, like really very down to earth experiences. But uh, there's a there's a fair amount of consistency. Um, some people, because I, I, what I tend to do is say, like, are you getting a name? And it's, it kind of sounds like woo woo, but it's not. Like we tend to find that when someone's looking at a scene, sometimes they look as the observer on a person, and they get a feeling that that was them. And sometimes they're looking out of the eyes of the person, so they can't see anyone around. But if they look down, they can see a pair of feet, sort of thing. Um, and so it's either the first or third person perspective that they have. And generally, if you say, you know, is there a name that comes to mind? And I've done it myself. I've been in, in that past life regression myself. A name just seems to come to mind. Oh, Thomas comes to mind. And the same with a year or a location. And some people, it doesn't. They go, I don't know. Kind of looks like maybe Europe. <laughs> but so there's not a, a rigid kind of process that this works this way every time because people's minds are different. But what I can say is when I do past life regressions with people, I always ask that that you, when you manifested as that person or you incarnated as that person, if that person could give the you of today any advice to make life better, what advice would they give? It is the most insightful, concise, appropriate advice that the person could ever receive. Yeah, so, so even if it's not necessarily true or real, there's a lot that you can... Yeah, the healing, the, the, the advice is real. And because, you know, if me telling someone to do something to change their life, there's a fair amount of chance that someone would reject that through their own defences, the, you know, defence mechanisms and things like that. People can find it hard to accept advice from others and then sort of um, assimilate it into themselves. Essentially, whether they're fictional or whether they're actually previous lives, that advice is essentially coming from them to them. Yeah. And they take that advice. And it, so it could be a teacher that was never heard properly, or it could be someone who didn't live their dreams. They give the most perfect advice on how they could live their life to make it better. Yeah. It's amazing. So that that really is your specialty and focus, isn't it? Going into that deep like in a place where your truth is and your personal lessons are so the whole past life thing so you you've had some really cool experiences in it but that's not really your focus your focus is that sort of you know that yeah. lesson and growth and and learning yeah yeah, yeah. Um, or or with some people it's a bit of fun oh i'd quite like to see who i was in a past life and we go back and we look at some because the mind is capable of it, whether it's making up stories or whether it's showing you glimpses through the window in a past incarnation. For some people, they sit on one side of the fence or the other. Some people don't care. But yeah, I, I tend to, a paid therapy client wouldn't be just going for a bit of a look around. They would be trying to do work. And generally speaking, um, people would come to me and ask to do a past life regression that they feel that they have trauma from a previous incarnation. I would tend to not suggest that as a therapeutic. I think that I've got more um, efficient ways to help people heal than looking at past lives. That's a very personal thing. That's just me. I've got two questions, right? Yeah. That sort of come from the same place. Have you ever had somebody who doesn't believe in any of this that's done the past life thing or even done hypnotherapy, at, you know, in a really deep, sort of scale that it's then led them to believe in a bigger you know maybe yes. they're atheists and now they believe in something yes uh and also has this led you to believe in 
something bigger as opposed to like the atheistic view it's all in it you know a, a cosmic accident and there's no meaning and and things like that um no i for a possibly forever um i've never been like scientifically materialistic in the sense of the physical world is all there is um certainly i, I would kind of i've been doing a lot of research into kind of quantum physics and ancient history and all these sorts of subjects for 20 years or so, um, more 25. Uh, and it has aided my understanding. Um, so I suppose a very personal subjective journey. But yeah, the more that I explore with people, the more ethereal realm. And my, you know, in, in hypnosis, there's loads of things that we can do I tend to not do them because I'm a really busy guy with kids and stuff. But like, there is tons of research that you could do using hypnosis. Once you unhook from the tight confines of the left brain with language and time and things like that, and you start swimming in the kind of um, symbolic free right brain, um, the, the possibilities are crazy. They're endless. Um, there are, there are um, examples of things that are just uh mind boggling that hypnosis can achieve um that i would like to explore further but certainly as part of my studies of um, i study religions and i study you know the the not the occult but the um the esoteric i suppose um certainly the more past life regressions and people's experiences that i kind of come across the more it helps me in my own personal journey of learning so it's just more confirmation to you more than yeah yeah yeah. Do you think you um, could be an atheist and no hypnotherapy to the level that you do? Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's the so there is nothing in my mind, there is nothing woo woo about hypnosis. So, like, if you've ever been watching TV and you're kind of absorbed in what you're watching, and someone says your tea's ready and you don't respond, even though you kind of you knew they were there, you knew you heard them, but you were absorbed in that that's hypnosis or the driving thing where you kind of forgot that you were even driving for 10 minutes or if you're staring out a window and you're looking at the whatever's out the window but you're not really paying attention to that you're miles away someone taps you on the shoulder and says come on we've got to go and you're like god that was miles away there you were in hypnosis yeah it's just they, they describe hypnosis as a prolonged period of internal focus so when i say close your eyes and start counting down from 300 and taking nice slow deep breaths by you having to imagine the number and focus on your breathing, we create a prolonged period of internal focus where you stop paying attention to the outside world and how bright that light is, what color that seat is, the sound of someone's voice, and start paying attention to your inner experience, even if it's just your breathing and counting downwards. You start a process that settles down the busy conscious mind and opens that protective gate that stands between the conscious jibber jabber of the conscious mind and it opens the gate to allow access to the belief systems and that that ocean of knowledge and experience the unconscious yeah. so it's, it's not it's not like howling at the moon it's, it's very much like <laughs> there, is, there is language that makes the mind relax yeah. there are processes is layers though is there layers of it because the depths that we're we were talking about you know earlier when you're looking at the past life stuff yeah. do you think that uh, well I, I read a book recently i forgot the name um but he was a doctor in i think new york and he he was a therapist um in term, like a psychology like psychology and he was dealing with a woman who had really bad anxiety and nothing was helping so then what he, tr he decided to do is to try hypnotherapy and he took her so deep that she explained a past life and he really started to explore that and he wrote a book on it and it's unbelievably interesting and it converted him from being very materialistic, you know, material minded and science and all of this to really kind of believing that reincarnation is real. And he comes at it from a scientific perspective. I, I forgot the name of the book. Uh, it's really interesting, though. But do you think that, um, and again, going back to that other question, um, people who would accidentally through therapy go to that depth uh do you think that that could convert people to believe that there is something more 
yes, as could near-death experience or spontaneous out-of-body experience or yeah. mushrooms or DMT. <laughs> um, yeah, once yeah. There, there is a, there is, if there is an ethereal realm, or maybe there is, whether it's real or just perceived, once you interact more with that, um, I don't like the word ethereal, but non-physical realm, then I think that that's got a good likelihood of potentially changing your perception of the world. Yeah. I'm always very wary of the new agey stuff. Um, if anyone looks at my Twitter and even the interviews I've done before, I'm very, very careful not to cross that line. But there's definitely something in it, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. And the reason I ask is because you've probably, like I say, seen a lot to prove, at least to you, that there's more. And I think ultimately, you know, I always say that with like the lockdowns and things like that that happened all those years ago, like human beings are led by the fear of the unknown. That's my biggest fear. And I think most people can, you know, can probably agree with that. And the biggest unknown, and I think this is by design, is death. And the two kind of main views that you get in the West, and especially today, today's day and age, is you get the big black nothing, right, which is a whole atheistic, you know, I won't know when I'm dead anyway, so none of it matters. So what's the point? YOLO, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, which brings in nihilism. And then you've got the other thing, which is like the burning hate, the burning gates of hell, you know, burning in hellfire because I've been a sinner. So then that creates a lot of guilt. So you've got almost two sides. You've got this, well, nothing matters anyway. And then this constant guilt, living in guilt and shame. And I think for that, as we said at the beginning of the call, that can lead to bigger psychological problems and issues and fears and addictions and things like this. But when you start really looking into things like the near death experiences and looking between the lines and um, figuring things out a little bit, you start to realize that there's 100% meaning in this life. Maybe you're not as important as you think you are because there's six, seven billion of us and, you know, there's a bigger picture, but your life absolutely has meaning and this all has meaning. And I think that's what sends you on this quest of knowledge and trying to figure things out and, you know, actually adding a bit of value to that and, and almost, and also looking within and realizing that there's this there's this place within where there is power and knowledge and you can connect to it and when you do it is a very personal and spiritual um experience and there's a lot of growth and opportunity to heal there even through things like suggestibility and all of this yeah. sort of stuff yeah i i think that the impact that each and every one of us has in the world is far greater than maybe it's too scary to think of that or feels like responsibility. Um, but yeah, I think I think that we should take ownership of who we are and what work we have to do. And I yeah. think I think that we should not I, for me, for me, I think there's a kind of joke that says, you know, believe in God because there's no risk either way. Believe in God and live your life as if there's a God and in fear of him and be moral. Because if you get to the end of your life and it's black and nothing, so what? You probably help some more people out of a bit of obligation to be as good as you can be. And if there's God, he goes, high five, well done, done a good job. So it's when it's, it's really, it's a, there's nothing to lose. I would say that living your life like there's meaning, like you're important. And like that you've got a job to do and it's either divinely or whatever word you would use. You've been sent here to live now for a reason and shoulder that responsibility and work and stand up and do the best and be the best that you can be. Yeah. That's, that's a better way to live your life than it's meaning. And even if that was delusion, if I live my life as if there was, say there was a God or a divine purpose, and I strived and I worked and I helped as many people as I could. And on my deathbed, close my eyes, done, gone, that's it. Well, I still lived my life better as a result of that belief. Yeah. One, it's meaning, there's no meaning, it's all random, it's all, you know, that's just, so, it's, I, I, could, I can imagine, so even from a psychological point of view, very hard to get up every morning. Yeah. Um, 
no reason to be kind or not kind, or kind or brutal. Like, yeah. it doesn't really matter. And I think it's abdicating responsibility. I think take ownership of your place in the universe and do what you can with it because you've been gifted it this life. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm with you. I'm definitely, definitely with you there. Um, I wanted to, there's another topic I wanted to go into, but maybe it's worth you coming on again in the future um, to talk okay. about. But that would be like the whole addiction thing. Mm-hmm. So I spoke to you uh, recently. So I've quit drinking. I'm like 45 days in. Um, yes. Like I said to you before, I did I did four months last year. So it's not like I got a drinking problem, but I'm starting to ask those bigger questions. I'm starting to look at why is it randomly on a Wednesday I feel the need to drink? You know, we, we've gone into all that. So maybe we can look into that in more depth on another yeah interview that could certainly be a whole discussion in itself yeah yeah so i'd I'd be interested to go into that and solutions but the last thing because we're just over an hour now that i wanted to sort of just go into quickly is so other than paying somebody to do a hypnotherapy session or you know multiple sessions to kind of benefit their lives and to start looking at growth what would you suggest is the best thing for people to do? Could they do their own hypnotherapy thing or videos on YouTube and doing that regularly? Or yeah, I mean, there are. sleep at night and visualize as you fall asleep? Like, is there any sort of thing that you'd say, right, th- try this, have give a go to this. And if you need more help, call me and we'll go into how to get hold of you and stuff at the end. I think so. One one part of it is the is the internal kind of thoughtful, reflective type type work. I think if you sit down on your bed and you say, what am I doing that is making life my life worse? And what am I not doing that could make my life better? You'll get answers. Definitely. Because we all F up regularly. And the more regularly and the bigger we do, the more it impacts us negatively. We, if we are honest with ourselves, even if we're scared of it, even if we feel we're not good enough for it, for any of the reasons that we hold ourselves back, we probably all know something that we could do to make our lives better. Don't be too, I suppose it's arrogant to think that we have to do everything the best that we can ever do on day one. I hate to get all Jordan Peterson on you, but like tidying your bedroom, having some sort of plan for the day. Maybe it's walk for five minutes every morning. Maybe it's making sure that dishes don't sit more than 12 hours in your kitchen before they get put away. Uh, Having some proactive structure in your life and some sort of plan of things that would be quite helpful in your life is is an actionable task that you can do that starts to make life better. Because (laughs) the opposite of order is chaos. And if you have chaotic lifestyle, chaotic relationships, chaotic chaotic thinking, you've probably done it for a lot of time. Why not give a little bit of order a try. Try and dress, present yourself smart, try and wash regularly, try and keep a clean environment because it's really hard, you know, to sit among chaos and think calmly and clearly. Yeah. So there's something that definitely helps. And I'm not saying it's the answer to everything, not saying it because it makes you happy, but it creates an environment in which you can then work to make yourself happy. And this is free. This is free advice and it's free to do. Mm-hmm. There, there's an interview um, Guy Ritchie did. He did one with Joe Rogan, um, but there's another interview he did with another podcast and he talks about like this theory of like owning it. So he's talk- Joe's talking about his suit. And he's like, you know, you're coming here with a suit and your pocket square. And he's like, listen, Joe, this suit is my idea. I own this suit, right? And he really goes into this idea of ownership. He's like, I'm not wearing this suit because I was told to wear it. I'm wearing it because it's my idea and I've designed it to look this way. Um, And yeah, this sort of whole thing with, um, you know, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So make it your, uh, your idea and Mm -hmm. take that level of of ownership and and control. Um, And that, would you say that just, sort of starting there as a foundation could lead you to more and more growth yes. And yes 
as soon as you see the benefit from it, the moment that you see one small benefit from one good choice, there's momentum to make life better. Yeah. You often find that people who are really high achievers, uh, a lot of the times they do some sort of like martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time they don't drink, which is we'll go into that another time because that's a massive topic. We've had a really good conversation about that. And yeah, I've probably got a lot to say about that as well. Um, but, you know, they normally go to the gym. They normally eat, work, eat relatively well, whatever diet it is that they're into. But it's that kind of knock-on effect of... of is this successful people? Yeah. Nine, I would say 99% of highly successful people get up in the morning before 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. There's If you're looking for a measure of who wants it in this life bad enough, it, those who sleep in don't yet have the discipline to be highly successful. Yeah. I can't sleep in anymore. I was up at five yesterday. I was at the golf course yesterday, <laughs> teeing off while the sun was coming up. So I was and just, you, wait, did you feel good? Oh, I felt amazing, yeah. Yeah. Come sort of nine, half nine at night, I'm I'm done. But nothing good happens at that time anyway for me. I'm like, what? I've got no energy. I can't really focus. And you just feel you're just watching brain dead TV and normally you're in that kind of hypnosis state because you're, you're you're winding down and the things that you're wa watching are again suggestible and maybe that's another thing we can go into as well the whole thing with tv and suggestibility because not only are you able to do it to yourself but you're constantly being programmed through yes. that state of and I, I talk a lot about how so if we do to a degree create our own environments and our own reality do not think the powers that be know that and do not think on a collective scale they can they're aware that you drop sometimes your brain waves drop especially at certain times and certain times of the day and you know when you're watching or listening to things or driving you've got the radio with all the news on and that almost kind of putting this symbology into your subconscious which is on a large scale you know what do they call it uh revelation of the method you know, by putting it in there and then we're all believing a way, you know, a certain way of thinking or certain events may happen. To what degree are we actually bringing that onto ourselves collectively? You know, so no, another big topic. We won't go there too much now because it could be yes. another hour, but. That's a good topic. Why do they call it television programming? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Edward, where can people find you? And. What sort of things are you up to at the minute and what are you looking to do in the future? Um, so you can find me, um, uh, the Scottish hypnotherapist, gmail.com. Um, yeah. I've got a website, edwardaddison.com. It's actually, <laughs> um, I started a weight loss support last year. I've seen a few clients over the years for weight loss. What I was thinking, what I was working on with them was, we work together for three or six sessions with hypnosis. We clear out the old, we're feeling good. They leave, you know, go off and start losing weight. But because weight loss takes months, months to lose five stone, 10 stone, whatever it might be, um, the same environmental pressures, whether it's a difficult relationship at home or an ill mother or, you know, work is stressful. Because all these things, often a lot of these things that, that cause the behavior are still present, it's quite, it tended to not work quite how I wanted it to. It was, it was more, I thought that ongoing support would be a better thing for this. So I created a wee, I think, it's a very clever name, Weight Loss with Edward. Um, and uh, I help people lose weight and develop resilience and strength of character, self-worth, self-value and all that sort of stuff. And although on the surface, because loads of people lose weight and it's called weight loss, it's weight loss support. Really, what it is is hypnosis, therapy, life coaching, CBT, and all these things where we get sleep fixed, we get stress lowered, and it ties to weight loss. Lower cortisol levels mean more weight loss. It also means a calmer and happier <laughs> existence. Um, working on interpersonal relationships, the relationship with food, the relationship with our partners, and all these things 
Um, and so people, yeah, they lose loads of weight because life gets better. Um, and gaining weight is often a, a side effect or an effect of life not being as you would like it. So we get life feeling better and weight comes off nice and easily. So um, I do that. I wasn't expecting to be quite as busy doing that, but. Um, yeah. I was going to say, that's not really where you started off, but it's. No, 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 no. So I have, um, I, I accept about six or sometimes I push eight clients a week for actual one-to-one therapy and um, simply because um, I, I'm doing therapy with all my weight loss clients, but there's hundreds of them. So um, time is short in the week, shall we say. Yeah. Um, but it's it's nice because it's a psychological approach to weight loss. And really people, I would say that it's not a weight loss group, it's a happiness group that I run. Um, it just happens to be that weight loss People come because they want to lose weight. It's then that we kind of we de- we delve into the esoteric, we de- you know, spiritual beliefs and all yeah. sorts of things. If you can heal your life, then of course you'll enjoy making healthy choices with food. You'll not be trying to surrogate happiness or comfort or all these things with sugar because you've actually you're actually happy and your soul is satiated by life. Therefore, you don't feel the need to compensate with anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing lots of, lots of lots of stuff like that accidentally it wasn't it wasn't meant to take over from full-time therapist but it kind of has to some extent just by its success yeah i guess you go, go where the demand is but maybe we'll talk about this in the next one as well if we do focus on the whole addiction thing yeah. uh, it sounds to me like your solution so if i come to you with any addiction the solution is kind of nearly always the same or the the process that you would go through would kind of always be a similar one yeah pretty much anyone that i work with the reason that you behave the way that you behave in an unwanted way is because you carry things whether it be emotions or thinking patterns or beliefs or fears from the past through things that you've lived through yeah so if you can recognize what you carry and let the past truly become the past it no longer inhibits who you are or drives the unwanted behavior yeah. anxiety insomnia erectile dysfunction poor eating doesn't matter what it is more nine times out of ten or nine point nine times out of ten the the influence of the past and what you have lived through is overshadowing your current reality so we deal with the past and fear present in your future wow yeah i think on that note probably leave it there but i'd love to have you on again and uh go cool. into yeah. those topics and you know real solutions other than booking in with you obviously um, <laughs> But yeah, okay, brilliant. Well, look, thanks for coming along. Really appreciate it. Great. Really good to speak. And uh, yeah, let's speak soon. Anytime.